Ethiopia is a country that captivates, unique in the world for its astonishing rock-carved constructions. With spectacular landscapes and a rich and distinct culture, where some of the wonders built by mankind exist. It's one of the few African countries that was never colonized. Therefore, it has been able to preserve its traditions and customs over the years. Language, religion, and architecture have survived in Ethiopia without colonial influence for centuries. It's a country with unparalleled ethnic diversity. A multiplicity of communities, each with its unique culture, are spread across the various Ethiopian regions. Furthermore, it's a land filled with national parks. with a variety of landscapes and extreme territories. Stay with me to discover what Ethiopia and its people are like, why it's a unique country in the world, the places you can't miss, how life is in the country, and so much more. One, Ethiopia is one of the oldest countries in the world with a territory that has remained intact for millennia. In ancient times, it was the center of the Aksumite kingdom whose monarchs claimed descent from the kings of Israel, including David and Solomon. Later, around the year 1000, the Aksumite Empire was destroyed by the Zagwe dynasty, which had its capital in Lalibela. Around the year 1270, the Solomonic dynasty was restored with Yakuno Amlak, marking the beginning of the Ethiopian Empire, or Abyssinia. During the attempts at European colonization, Ethiopia managed to remain independent. In 1896, Italy succumbed to Ethiopia at the Battle of Adwa. It was a historic moment, the first time an African nation defeated a European power. Later on, in 1935, Italy attempted once again to occupy Ethiopia and succeeded in capturing Addis Ababa. Following Mussolini's invasion, Emperor Haile Selassie went into exile in the United Kingdom. However, Ethiopian resistance persisted and the Italian forces were expelled in 1941. The last ruler of the Solomonic dynasty and Ethiopian empire was Emperor Selassie, who reigned until 1974 when the monarchy was abolished and the country became a people's republic. 
two, there are several reasons explaining why Ethiopia remains an uncolonized country. The geography of its territory makes it difficult to invade. With high mountains, rugged terrains, and extremely arid deserts with high temperatures. On the other hand, during the scramble for Africa, Ethiopia was led by Emperor Menelik II. He is said to have been a strong leader who managed to unify various regions of the country and strengthen the army, triumphing in key battles against Italy. Finally, even though Ethiopia is a country with immense ethnic and cultural diversity, a shared national identity and social cohesion played a role in resistance to colonialism. Three, Ethiopia, officially the Federal Democratic Republic of Ethiopia, is located in the Horn of Africa, a peninsula in the northeast of the continent. It is surrounded by several countries, bordering Eritrea to the north, Djibouti and Somalia to the east, Sudan and South Sudan to the west, and Kenya to the south. It has been landlocked since Eritrea gained its independence in 1993. It is one of the most populous countries in Africa, and one of the largest in terms of land area. Ethiopia's geography is so varied that different regions seem like different countries. In the north and center, the high and cold mountains. On the border with Eritrea and Djibouti, the hot desert regions. The most prominent geographical feature of Ethiopia is the Great Rift Valley. It is a massive geological fault that runs through Ethiopia from the northeast to the southwest. It is the cause of the country's volcanic and seismic activity. In the Ethiopian highlands are the Simeon Mountains and the Bale Mountains. And there are several important rivers, primarily the Blue Nile, which originates in Lake Tana, the country's largest lake. Each of these areas is home to various animal species some unique to this territory. Four, the Ethiopian political system is a federal democratic republic with territorial organization divided into regional states and cities with special status, one of which is Addis Ababa, the Ethiopian capital. Due to the country's ethnic diversity, these states were chosen based on ethnic criteria. That is, the largest ethnic groups have their own region and state.
Some of these state regions are the Somali Regional State, the Afar region, the Oromia region, the Amhara region, and the Tigray region. 5. There are about 80 distinct ethnic groups living in Ethiopia. The most numerous are the Oromo, Amhara, Somali, Tigrinya, Sidama, Welaita, Hadia, Afar, among many others with smaller populations. There are five official languages, Oromo, Amharic, Somali, Tigrinya, and Afar, with Amharic and Oromo being the most spoken by far. The Ethiopian writing system is Gez or Amharic, one of the oldest scripts still in use. The Oromo, the largest ethnic group, are found in the central south of Ethiopia. They are herders, farmers, coffee traders, or urban workers in big cities. The Amhara, the second largest ethnic group, are predominantly farmers. They also have a long history of governmental administration. For many centuries, they have had significant influence on the country's culture, including the adoption of Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity. The Somalis live in the Somali region in eastern Ethiopia. Many are nomadic or semi-nomadic herders, making a living from goat and camel livestock, though some are also farmers. The Tigray, or Tigrinya, live in the north, above the Amhara. They are usually farmers, cultivating grains and legumes in the highlands. As you'll see, this region is notable for its unique rock-hewn churches. The Afar stand out for living in the most arid and inhospitable areas of Ethiopia. Over the centuries, they've developed techniques to adapt to the extremely hot environment of the Danakil Desert. They have distinctive physical features that differentiate them from other ethnic groups. They are predominantly nomadic herders, their lifestyle centered on breeding and caring for livestock, such as camels, goats, and sheep. The most practiced religion among the Afar is Islam, combined with ancestral practices and beliefs. In a far culture, family and clan ties are fundamental. Society is organized into patrilineal clans, with each individual owing loyalty to their clan. Conflicts are often resolved through traditional mediation and justice systems. Men are responsible for tending the livestock and protecting the family and clan.
Meanwhile, women perform most domestic chores, raising children and taking care of the elderly. 6. Some of Ethiopia's minority ethnic groups live in the Omo Valley in southwestern Ethiopia, with the Omo River crossing savannas and jungles. This river is a lifeline for many of these tribes, providing water and soils for agriculture and livestock. One of these Omo Valley ethnic groups is the Hamer. They are an agricultural and pastoral community that relies on livestock breeding such as goats and sheep. These animals provide not only milk and meat, but also have a social meaning. For the Hamer members, the amount of livestock one owns is an indicator of wealth and social status. One of the most important Hamer rituals is the bull jumping ceremony or Ukuli Bula. This rite of passage for young males involves the youth walking without falling over a row of bulls. If he successfully completes the test, he's recognized as a man and deemed ready to marry and start his own family. Strikingly, Hamer women have a characteristic hairstyle decorated with red clay wearing copper necklaces and bracelets. Men often choose various styles. Some shave their heads entirely and wear a type of fur. Others go for a half shave, leaving a patch of hair to grow. Seven, the Karo who also reside in the Omo Valley, are distinguished by the white paints they wear on their faces and bodies. Like other groups in this area, they rely on agriculture, cultivating sorghum, maize, and beans on the lands along the river. For important ceremonies and rituals, they adorn themselves with white paint, creating intricate designs on their skin. A form of body art that serves as a means of expression and to symbolically represent social status. Karo women often wear earrings, jewelry, and decorative scars called scarifications, which are considered marks of beauty and bravery. 8. Another ethnicity from this valley is the Mercy, known for their practice of body modification, particularly the insertion of clay plates into the lower lips of women. Mercy men practice the donga, a dueling ritual in which young males combat with long sticks to resolve disputes or establish status within the community. Also notable in the area is the Bana ethnic group, 
whose young male members traditionally walk on stilts. They have done this traditionally to avoid being attacked by wild animals, although today it is a pastime for children and adolescents. The Arbore are only a few thousand in population. They practice subsistence farming and livestock breeding. Men can marry up to four women, with marriages being arranged. They believe in a supreme being they call Wak. One of the features of this tribe is their spirituality. Legend has it that on one occasion a demon attacked them, but they survived, with their leaders emerging strengthened. Elders are highly respected playing a significant role in the community's decision-making. Nine, the Great Rift Valley crosses through the Omo Valley, running through the country up to Eritrea. It is a massive geological fracture that starts in Southeast Africa, in Mozambique, and reaches the Red Sea. It began forming millions of years ago, but today it continues to grow slowly, both in length and width. Over millennia, the Somali tectonic plate will separate from the African plate, forming a new subcontinent. The rift strip that runs through Ethiopia stands out for its vastness, containing various lakes, each with a unique ecosystem. Lake Ziwai, for example, is known for its abundant aquatic birds, while Lake Abihata stands out for its flamingos. It is in the Great Rift Valley, not far from Addis Ababa, where Lucy was found, one of the oldest and most complete hominid fossils ever discovered, at around three million years old. Hence, Ethiopia is often called the Cradle of Humanity. Lucy named because the paleoanthropologists were listening to the Beatles song Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds when they found her, was a female of the Australopithecus afarensis species who walked upright and could climb with her long arms. Ten, in northern Ethiopia, we find a geological wonder, the Danakil Depression, one of the Earth's lowest and hottest areas. At times, the climate becomes extremely hot and the terrain is inhospitable, receiving little precipitation throughout the year. It's a geologically dynamic zone where three tectonic plates are pulling apart, resulting in a landscape of molten lava, sulfur springs, and acidic lakes. The Urta Ale, located in the Donakil Desert, is one of the few volcanoes in the world with an almost permanent lava lake.
it has been active since 1906, making it one of the longest-lasting lava lakes on the planet. It's a mesmerizing natural sight, especially at night when the lava illuminates the sky with a red glow. Another geological wonder in the Donakil Depression is the Dalal Volcanic Crater. Its landscape could serve as a filming location for a sci-fi movie, with sulfur mounds, salt ponds, and colorful mineral formations. This region of Ethiopia is recognized as one of the most tectonically active on the planet, situated at the trilateral convergence of the Nubia, Somalia, and Arabia tectonic plates. Its spectrum of bright colors, ranging from white to green, yellow, and red, results from the chemical reactions to its thermal waters with ground minerals. Danakil is also home to a field of geysers, showcasing astonishing shapes and colors. And to vast salt plains. According to legend, this area was rich in gold but the gods punished the inhabitants by turning the gold into salt. For centuries, workers have mined the salt from the ground, cutting it into blocks. They then transport it in long camel caravans. Despite the high temperatures and scarce water, workers live and work here during the mining season. This tradition remains alive today, but is seen less frequently as roads have been built to transport the salt by trucks. Eleven, to the south of Donakil, but still in northern Ethiopia, is Lalibela. It's a city with astonishing rock-hewn churches. Following Aksum, it's Ethiopia's second most significant spiritual center. The king for whom Lalibela is named, Gebre Mesgel Lalibela, wanted to construct a second Jerusalem after Muslims conquered the Holy Land. Because of this and its atmosphere filled with pilgrims, prayers, and biblical ambiance, Lalibela is called the Second Jerusalem. It's a significant center of Ethiopian Orthodox Christian faith. During festivities such as Christmas and Epiphany, thousands of pilgrims from all over the country gather in Lalibela to pray and sing. In this city, there are 11 churches built in the 12th century during the reign of King Lalibela, who, according to legend, was assisted by angels.
These are monolithic churches carved directly into solid volcanic rocks. It is believed they were carved with very basic tools, such as hammers and chisels. They are connected by a series of tunnels and underground passageways. Some monks and hermits live in small cells carved into the rocks surrounding the churches. One of these churches is Biat Georgis, or the Church of St. George. Many view it as one of the miraculous human creations. To build it, large amounts of rock were removed. Today, it remains an important pilgrimage site, especially during the celebration of Timkat. But let's look at others that are equally astonishing. This one is Biat Emmanuel, which was possibly a royal chapel. Next, we have Biat Mescal, or House of the Cross. This is Biat Abba Libanos. And this other one is Biat Golgata Mikael. Twelve, Aksum is the religious capital of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church the center of the ancient kingdom of Aksum. This city is known for its massive obelisks, which are believed to mark the graves of the former rulers of the empire. The tallest, the obelisk of Aksum, is thought to have been one of the tallest monolithic structures of antiquity. One of the most intriguing places in Ethiopia is in Aksum. It's the Church of St. Mary of Zion. According to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, in a chapel adjacent to the main building lies the Ark of the Covenant, which holds the tablets of the Ten Commandments. It is believed to have arrived nearly 3,000 years ago and has been guarded by a succession of monks to this day. Legend has it that the Queen of Sheba, a wealthy queen mentioned in the Bible and the Quran, traveled from Aksum to Jerusalem to visit King Solomon. Upon her return to Aksum, she bore a son Melanich, who, as an adult, would journey to Jerusalem to meet Solomon, his presumed father. Melanich returned with a group of Israeli nobles who took the Ark from Jerusalem. When Melanich learned of this, he believed it was God's will for the relic to remain with him since the Ark's power did not destroy its bearers. No one can view the Ark except the High Priest who appoints a successor on his deathbed. The locals are prepared to defend it with their lives, a commitment that was evident during the Tigray War. 13. Aksum is located in the Tigray region, home to a series of enigmatic mountain-carved churches built centuries ago. The 
the most breathtaking is Abuna Yamata. Incredibly, it's perched on this sheer cliff face. It's one of the world's most inaccessible churches. Named after Saint Abuna Yamata, a 5th century priest, legend says he built the church after scaling the cliff. Access is only through a perilous ascent along narrow paths bordering the abyss. The church's walls and ceiling are adorned with 15th century paintings. These depict biblical episodes and portrayals of saints. Tombs of various saints and monks can be found near the church. Close to Abuna Yamata is Daniel Korkor, perched atop another cliff. Offering views of Tigray's mountainous landscapes. The church's isolation and the challenge of reaching it are considered by some as a test of faith. Like in other monasteries, you might find hermits or monks living nearby, dedicating their lives to prayer and meditation. The church's interior is decorated with frescoes of saints. Further north, near the border with Eritrea, is Debre Damo. This monastery can only be accessed or exited using a rope anchored to the rock wall. Tradition says God lowered the rope to aid Abuna Aregawi, the monastery's founder, in reaching the top. Monks at Debre Damo lead simple, austere lives in small cells and caves around the monastery. Legend has it that these monks were the first to domesticate honeybees in Ethiopia. 14. Also in northern Ethiopia are the Blue Nile Falls. The cascade throws a mist into the air, leading to its local name, Tis Abai, meaning Smoke of the Nile. The Blue Nile, which starts at Lake Tana, is one of the two main tributaries of the Nile River, the other being the White Nile, originating from Lake Victoria. Lake Tana is Ethiopia's largest, formed by volcanic activity thousands of years ago. Here, locals sail in their papyrus boats, risking their lives, as certain areas of the lake are home to hippos, Africa's deadliest mammal. 15. In the Ethiopian region of Amhara, heading north, lie the Simeon Mountains. Here is Ras Dashen, the highest peak of Ethiopia and one of the tallest in Africa. Several endangered animal species have their habitat in this area. Mm -hmm. 
One is the Ethiopian wolf, similar to the coyote, but with a longer and narrower head and a reddish and white coat. It's one of the rarest canids in the world. Its population is only composed of a few hundred individuals. Another endangered species from this region is the Ethiopian mountain goat, endemic to the country. Also living in the Simeon Mountains is the Gelida monkey. Unlike many other primates, Gelidas spend most of their day on the ground instead of in trees. To protect themselves from predators such as hyenas or leopards, they can sleep on cliffs. They are distinguished from baboons by the colorful skin on their chest. Like other primate species, they form small groups with one male, several females, and their offspring. Currently, they are not considered endangered, but their population has declined rapidly due to habitat loss and hunting. Sixteen. Addis Ababa, whose name in Amharic means new flower, is the largest metropolis and the capital of Ethiopia, nestled in the central highlands of the country. As the financial, cultural, and administrative center of Ethiopia, it ranks among the highest capitals in the world. One of the most significant places in Addis Ababa is the National Museum of Ethiopia, where the fossilized skeleton of Lucy is located. Another iconic place is the Mercato, one of Africa's largest markets, where one can find everything from local crafts and textiles to fresh food and spices. There is also the Holy Trinity Cathedral, built to commemorate the liberation from Italian occupation. It's the second most important place of worship in Ethiopia, after the Church of St. Mary of Zion in Aksum. Seventeen. East of Addis Ababa is the city of Harar, known as the Walled City of Islam, where its old town stands out, surrounded by a defensive wall. Within the walls is a maze of narrow cobbled alleys with numerous Arabic-style houses and historic mosques. In Harar, there's a strange tradition since the 60s, feeding wild hyenas. It began when a local farmer decided to feed them to prevent them from eating his livestock. And it has continued to this day, although now for touristic reasons. Some of these Ethiopian men name the hyenas and speak to them in a mix of English and Oromo, feeding them with their mouths to make the activity more spectacular. 18. Another historic Ethiopian city is Gondor, close to the Simeon Mountains, which in the past was the capital of the Ethiopian Empire. It is known as the City of Castles 
as it features several of these structures. A must visit is the Fossil Gebi Fortress, built in the 17th century, which includes a series of castles, royal residences, and courtyards, all surrounded by tall walls. The main castle, or Fasilidas Palace, is a masterpiece of the architecture of the time. 19. Some of the Ethiopian national parks are located in the Omo Valley area, like the Mago National Park, the country's first national park. It's one of the last wildlife refuges in Ethiopia for endangered species. The habitats in the park range from acacia savannas to gallery forests along the rivers, allowing for high biodiversity. Here live lions, leopards, hippos, buffaloes, cheetahs, giraffes, hyenas, wild dogs, Nile crocodiles, zebras, elephants, among many other species. Another is the Nechizar National Park, characterized because part of its territory is covered by lakes. In this park, on the northwest stretch of Lake Chamo, there's an area known as Crocodile Market, where hundreds of Nile crocodiles gather to sunbathe. Until the 19th century, elephants were common throughout much of Ethiopia and were distributed across the country, except in the north. Unfortunately, their population has experienced a sharp decline, driven by poaching for ivory and the disappearance of their habitat. Currently, there are only elephants in five or six areas of the country, which could vanish if urgent measures are not taken. Twenty. The year in Ethiopia is 13 months long, 12 months of 30 days each, and an additional month that has five days in a regular year and six in a leap year. The Ethiopian New Year, or Enkutatash, is celebrated on the 1st of Meskerem, which is September 11th in their Gregorian calendar, or September 12th in leap years. It can be celebrated outdoors, as it coincides with the end of the rainy season and the beginning of spring in Ethiopia. Children often go door to door, singing songs and offering bouquets of flowers. In return, they are given a small gift, such as money or bread. Additionally, the Ethiopian year is almost eight years behind the rest of the world, due to the Ethiopian church calculating the year of Christ's birth differently. 21. What most confuses foreigners when they come to live in Ethiopia is the system of time measurement. While the rest of the world considers a day as 24 hours, in Ethiopia, a day is divided into two cycles of 12 hours. A daytime cycle from sunrise to sunset, and a nighttime cycle from sunset to sunrise. When the sun rises, an Ethiopian says it is one in the morning, and when it gets dark, it is one at night. This makes sense as Ethiopia is very close to the equator, so daylight hours are consistent throughout the year. The daytime with sunlight is typically 12 hours long, and the nighttime in darkness is also 12 hours. Throughout the year, sunrise and sunset happen at the same times. If it were seven in the morning on a western clock, in Ethiopia, they would say it's the first hour of the day because an hour has already passed since their day began. The same goes for sunset. 
If it were seven in the evening in a Western country, in Ethiopia they would say, it's the first hour of the night. 22. The most practiced religion in Ethiopia, encompassing people from all ethnic groups, is Ethiopian Orthodox Christianity. 23. According to tradition, Christianity was introduced in the 4th century with the arrival in the kingdom of Aksum of a Greek-speaking missionary named Frumentius, who converted King Ezana. Through this encounter, Christianity began to spread in the region. This Orthodox Christianity developed its own traditions over the centuries, combining elements of the Old Testament, Jewish tradition, and the teachings of the New Testament. It is notable for its devotion to local saints, biblical figures, and its religious ceremonies. On the other hand, the arrival of Islam dates back to 615, when the Prophet Muhammad sent a group of his followers to seek refuge in the kingdom of Aksum. However, it wasn't until the 11th century that Islam began to spread more widely in the region. 23. The celebrations of Ethiopian Christianity are very different from those in other countries where this religion is practiced. Timkat is an important day for Ethiopian Orthodox Christians. It's the celebration of the Epiphany, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River. It not only commemorates the baptism of Jesus, but is also a celebration of renewal and purification. It is seen as an opportunity to rejuvenate the spirit and reaffirm the foundations of Christian belief. It is celebrated on January 19th, which in the Ethiopian calendar is the 10th day of Tur. The celebration of Timkat begins the day before, known as Ketera. Replicas of the Ark of the Covenant, called Tabots, are carried in procession by priests under large, colorful umbrellas, followed by a crowd of believers. Timkat Day is when the reenactment of the baptism takes place. Before dawn, people gather around the water where the procession was held. A high-ranking priest performs the blessings of the water. Water is then sprinkled on the faithful, some of whom dive in to symbolize their own baptism and purification. Twenty-four. Another religious holiday is Christmas, called Gena, celebrated on the day Jesus was born. For the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, this day is the 29th of Tassas in their calendar, which corresponds to January 7th in the Western Gregorian calendar. Ethiopian Orthodox Christians fast for 43 days, known as Tsome Nebiyat, or the Fast of the Prophets. They cannot eat meat or drink alcohol. 25. Ethiopia has produced some of the best long-distance runners in history, who typically come from three ethnic groups, the Oromo, the Amara, and the Tigray. The reason Ethiopian athletes are so enduring is that these ethnicities come from the country's highlands. 
living and training at high altitudes leads to natural physiological adaptations that enhance endurance. Moreover, in Ethiopia, running is a part of life for some rural communities. Children in these areas may have to run long distances from an early age to go to school, which develops aerobic endurance. 26. Besides Christians and Muslims, there are Jews in Ethiopia called Beta Israel, believed to have arrived in the country from Egypt during the Exodus or after the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem. In the mid-20th century, they began emigrating from Ethiopia to Israel, where most currently reside, being recognized by the Israeli state since 1975 as authentic Jews. 27. A curious Ethiopian custom, due to the strangeness it might evoke in foreigners, is the Gersha. In Ethiopia, it's common to eat with one's hands and share a large communal tray. During a meal, an Ethiopian might take a piece of injera, a type of flatbread, use it to pick up some food, and then place it in another person's mouth. This act is called Gersha and its size can indicate the level of respect one has for another person. A larger gersha might be seen as a sign of greater affection. Conversely, refusing a gersha can be seen as offensive, as it's considered a friendly gesture. 28. Polygamy in Ethiopia was abolished, although there is a small percentage of communities that practice it. According to the law, marriage must be between two individuals. However, religious laws are recognized if both parties are followers of the same custom or religion. It's more commonly practiced among the Afar, and Somali ethnic groups. While less common among the Amara and Tigray. Moreover, some interpretations of Islam allow polygamy, though this is subject to variation and debate. In any case, this practice is declining particularly in urban areas and among the younger generations. Twenty-nine. The Rastafari movement, which began in Jamaica in the 1930s, has strong connections to Ethiopia. Rastafarians regard Haile Selassie, whose name was Rastafari before becoming emperor, as a divine figure. He was revered as the promised Messiah who would liberate the black race, a belief rooted in Selassie's supposed descent from the Queen of Sheba and King Solomon. Even though Selassie denied being the Messiah, Rastas continue to believe he is a messenger from God. In Rastafari theology, Ethiopia is considered the promised Zion, paradise on earth. It is seen as the place from which people of African descent originate and to which they must ultimately return. 30. Ethiopia is the birthplace of coffee. According to legend, one day an Ethiopian shepherd named Kaldi noticed that his goats were behaving strangely, jumping around excitedly. He thought the cause might be a small bush with red berries, 
So he tried them, and, noticing the same effects, ran to tell his wife and then some monks, who, over time, began consuming the berries to better concentrate on their meditations. Ethiopian coffee is cultivated in various regions of the country, each with unique characteristics in terms of altitude, climate, and soil. It is the most produced and most exported Ethiopian product. The traditional process of its preparation is an Ethiopian cultural experience, the coffee ceremony. The beans are roasted in a small clay pot and then hand ground with a mortar. The coffee is brewed in a clay pot called habina and is served in small cups. 31. Let's talk about traditional Ethiopian food. Doro Wat is considered the national dish of Ethiopia. It is a spicy chicken stew, slow cooked with a mixture of spices, such as berbere or niterkiba. It is served with inhera and sometimes accompanied by boiled eggs. Kitfo is raw minced beef seasoned with spices and butter, served with inhera and seasoned with a spicy mix of spices called mitmita. Tebes is a dish with beef or lamb, sautéed with onion, peppers, and spices, which can be spicy or mild, served with inhera vegetables, or salads. Shiro is a thick paste similar to hummus, made from legume flour, like lentils or chickpeas, mixed with spices and oil, and can include meat or vegetables. 32. Life in Ethiopia depends on each ethnic group and income level although much of the population lives in rural areas. It's common for Ethiopians to live in humble dwellings and settlements. Families typically own cows, goats, camels, and other livestock. Life in general is economical, though vehicles are very expensive due to high import taxes. Ethiopia is situated in tropical latitudes, so in areas of the country with low elevation, there are high temperatures. But in the highland areas, the climate is more temperate. From September to February, there is a long dry season, followed by a short rainy season in March and April. May tends to be hot with little rainfall and in June, July, and August, there is another rainy season, this time longer. The lowest temperatures are usually between December and January, and the highest between March and May. 33. Ethiopia is one of the fastest growing economies in the world. This is mainly due to its robust agricultural activity, its growing service sector, and an increasing push into the manufacturing industry. However, despite this growth, parts of its population still live in poverty. Agriculture is the main pillar of the Ethiopian economy, with the cultivation of grains, legumes, vegetables, and fruits, along with livestock breeding. Coffee stands out as a vital export item in Ethiopia, alongside legumes and oil seed crops. In recent years, the Ethiopian textile industry has seen significant growth and has become a key sector, favored by affordable labor and a series of incentives provided by the government.
major international brands have set up factories in the country, producing textiles and garments for export. Similarly, tourism has experienced significant growth, with an increase in the number of visitors attracted by the rich history, culture, and natural landscapes. Thirty-four. The Ethiopian military is one of the most powerful in Africa, and one of the oldest in the world, with its origins dating back to the first millennium BC. It has existed in various forms throughout history, from the times of the Aksum Empire to the modern professional army it is today. Its size is due in part to the country's relatively large population and its location in a conflict-prone region. Notably, its victory in the Battle of Adwa in 1896 against the Italians during the First Italo-Ethiopian War allowed Ethiopia to maintain its independence during the scramble for Africa. 35. Given Ethiopia's mountainous topography, its military has developed a significant capability to fight at high altitudes. This was evident during the Ethiopia-Eritrea War, where the mountainous terrain was a major factor. Over the years, it has been an influential element in the country's internal conflicts, including that of the Tigray region. 35. If you're traveling to Ethiopia, there are certain behaviors, Ethiopian customs, and tips that are valuable to know. A typical greeting involves three kisses on each cheek for both men and women, although it might be four or five if you haven't seen the other person in a long time. It's better not to drive. The country has a high rate of traffic accidents. It's advisable to learn some Amharic words, as Ethiopians will appreciate it and it will endear you to them. Selam means hello. Amesaginalehu means thank you. Yikirta is please. Endetne is how are you. If you interact with Ethiopian families with children, a gift can leave a lasting, positive impression. You don't necessarily need a local guide to visit the country, but it can be very helpful, especially for those with little travel experience. Avoid criticizing the country or making negative comments, as it may be offensive. Steer clear of discussing political matters, issues related to tensions among different ethnicities, or religious topics. If you want to show interest in someone, ask about their region or how their children are doing. But avoid giving direct advice and don't ask about their ethnicity. 36. Also, avoid complaining or raising your voice too much. Be very cautious with food and drink. Don't drink unbottled water and eat foods that are well cooked. If possible, avoid salads or vegetables washed with non-potable water. Don't take photos of people without asking, as it can be considered rude or offensive. In general, for tourists, it is a safe country. But it's important to take basic safety precautions, like not carrying valuable items and not displaying wealth. Depending on when you visit, some regions of the country might be in conflict or dangerous, so it's important to stay informed. The most recent conflict is the Tigray War. The Tigray region, led by the Tigray People's Liberation Front, 
entered into a conflict with the Ethiopian federal government, accusing them of consolidating too much power and discriminating against the Tigray people. This led to a major humanitarian crisis with hundreds of thousands of deaths, human rights abuses, and massive displacements of people. After a series of negotiations with the Tigray People's Liberation Front, Ethiopia declared an indefinite humanitarian truce. However, tensions might flare up again. In conclusion, Ethiopia is a truly fascinating country, a melting pot of ancient cultures and traditions, of beautiful landscapes, and a history as old as humanity itself. We leave with a sense of wonder at its beauty and diversity, and with the intention to talk about this extraordinary corner of Africa again. See you soon.